Um, firstly, uh, I would like to say that I am aware of the, uh, the boldness, or I should say the proclaimed boldness uh, that the title of my talk bears, Hermeneutics Beyond Epistemology. It already sounds as a choice, um, picking hermeneutics as a way to overcome epistemology. Uh, it somewhat strikes as a uh, prolonged philosophical dispute, a continental analytical dispute. Um, hermeneutics, uh, at least uh, at least in its late Heideggerian form, uh, being a continental force, whereas epistemology is a core discipline of analytical philosophy. Although it appears as being rather reductionist and, and naive, I do strongly believe that we can, at least during this talk that we have here, uh, tackle these two camps differently. We will not insist on the, uh, this artificial divide nor on its historical development, but we shall keep in mind that we're constantly dealing with two different attitudes. And here is where it might get a little more tricky. We are ultimately dealing with two different objects of engagement. It's like two instruments of inquiry that although they are oriented towards the same perspectival object, they show two different objects. Uh, in other words, my claim is that hermeneutics does not engage with the same truth as epistemology does. Of course, we're not talking about disciplines as we're talking about certain instrumental attitudes. Uh, nevertheless, as we shall see, this step further that seemingly deepens the void between continental philosophy and analytical philosophy does the exact opposite movement. It raises the hypothesis that these two attitudes and these two claimed truths are part of the same agonistic experience that one has with the world. It is no longer the case for choosing, uh, picking between a narrative or a logical attitude towards reality. Uh, historically between a spiritual or a scientific method, between a subjective and an objective look, nor do we have to take phenomenology's proclaimed middle way. You know, we can see them as movements, as instruments that are part of the same gaze that one has upon the world, not contradictory, but paradoxical. With regards to the second part of my title, the one that does not sound as bold as it sounds rather obscure, a critique of biblical fictionalism. I make this theological turn in order to escape discussing philosophy only from within a philosophical vocabulary. It is also a return to what I believe to be the roots of hermeneutics, that being the interpretation of uh, scriptural texts. I believe that the problem of what one might call the biblical truth and its way of revelation of expression through words, through logos, could work as the nexus for our inquiry. Nevertheless, we can already ask why the Bible and why fictionalism? It is precisely because this comprehensive text with its powerful history and eschatological projections of the future is the ultimate truth for some and an utter fiction to others. Biblical fictionalism uh, within this rather unfriendly gap is a crutch for keeping these two together. Yet, although it theoretically might be somewhat productive, it practically has no effect. No one is moved, encouraged, changed, or even a tiny bit persuaded by the hypothesis of biblical fictionalism. We will talk about this later though. Uh, for now, I believe there is enough perplexity to start unpacking my, my thesis. The main purposes of this talk, as we can already suspect, are to treat the tensions between the hermeneutical attitude and the epistemological attitude. Uh, we shall do this later though, uh, through, throughout a brief inquiry into the structure of fiction. My first hypothesis is there are two immediate ways in which one can engage with the issue of fiction, the main being epistemological and the other being hermeneutical. Following this and moving beyond fiction, I seek not to discriminate between hermeneutics and epistemology with exclusivity, nor to use an analogical middle way, but to see them as complementary, though paradoxical movements or attitudes 
that work as a natural agonistic engagement with the world. This agonistic feature is concerning a truth that is not merely propositional, but a truth that can be ontological. It can be embodied, humane, dialogical. It can be a lived truth or to live a, a truthful life. In other words, if epistemology is, at least in some rough sense, preoccupied with the knowing that, with the, pr the propositional truth, hermeneutics is concerned with making that particular epistemological truth personal, making it true to me, adhering to my world, acquainting oneself to it almost dialogically. Maybe one may say propositional knowledge might come closer to acquaintance knowledge, precisely in the sense of the interactional trait of our engagement with the world. <clears throat> in this sense, what I maintain here is that I come to know something to be true because I have already presupposed it to be truthful. Therefore, these movements are naturally in the exact opposite order. One does not plunge into the process of knowledge from out of nowhere, nor can he ever engage with something without a certain vocabulary or attitude or belief towards that very thing that the knowledge grasps. To put it more technical, my thesis is that every propositional truth is first and foremost a presuppositional truth. Just as any scientific truth is bound to its referential object of reality, is not as bound to its uh, uh, referential object of reality as it is actually bound to its presuppositional matrix. Uh, it is, I should say, theory driven. I, now, in some sense, such idea uh, is in no way novel for we already see in the history of philosophy, brilliant criticism in, for example, Quine's relativistic ontology, and even probably more decisive in Donald Davidson endeavor to destabilize and destructure language and opt for maybe more continental concepts such as convention or interpretations. In that sense, there might already have been open doors between analytic philosophy and continental philosophy. Yet my hypothesis is far from being conciliatory as it is, as I said, agonistic. I suggest to slowly chew and digest this in, in two ways. Uh, one, we might use hermeneutics as a tool to contextualize and ground epistemology in its specific tradition and presuppositional network. And two, we might use epistemology as a constant call for the ultimate pretense of truth, uh, that which is reality, a reality that is or can be accessible objectively to human reasoning. So if I may say, the issue of truth here structurally resembles Kant's paradoxical ambivalence towards taste in his third critique as being grounded in a subjective affirmation, yet it always begs for universal communicability. And, and truth has always been in this incredibly powerful agony, that of being both the end of a methodological inquiry and of always being lurking or condemning uh, as common sense. And as we will see, the, the biblical proclamation of truth speaks most final in these exact terms. In order to be consistent and, and keep what I just announced as a constitutive part of uh, the way I move around philosophy, I shall ground my talk somewhere in, in, in some texts. <clears throat> the place that I find of particular importance for our discussion here is Tom Rockmore's article from 97, um, Gadamer, Rorty, and Epistemology as Hermeneutics. Uh, I say so precisely because of this uh, peculiar critique, his peculiar critique of uh, hermeneutics from within epistemological grounds and critique of epistemology from within hermeneutical grounds. But nevertheless, um, although I find his inquiry of great value, his conclusions fall short of a proper solution to the epistemology versus hermeneutics conflict. And we shall see in what way shortly after we work through his main hypothesis and maybe see what I believe to be his directed presuppositions. 
Rockmore's thesis is that the field of hermeneutics and the field of epistemology are not polar opposites, but are compatible forms of engaging the world. Uh, these are two complementary forms of knowledge. <clears throat> so far, I agree with this line of thought. But following this, he makes the claim that this compatibility is, a, is viable because epistemology is a form of hermeneutics. To prove his strange claim, Rockmore works uh, through the main figures in challenging the divide between epistemology and hermeneutics, Rorty and Gadamer. On, on, on one hand, Rorty's anti-epistemological skepticism opts for an equivocal hermeneutics. On the other hand, Gadamer sees hermeneutics as a critique of epistemology's pretense of cold and sharp scientific uh, method. For Rockmore, they are both in the wrong when making hermeneutics a rival and a solution to the, uh, for the claim failures of epistemology. In the first case, that of Rorty, his attitude towards epistemology is not that of a temperate or moderate deflationist, uh, such as, say, uh, Donald Davidson, but that of a radical skeptic. For if for Davidson, there is nothing really productive or even a tiny, a tiny bit interesting to say about uh, knowledge, Rorty is a blatant denier of such a thing as knowledge or truth. Maybe there is a place for justification, but there's nothing to be said about truth other than it is a cover or an adjective uh, that we usually apply to justified beliefs. Yet from this, he opts for hermeneutics and a hermeneutics where all that there is, is nothing but a series of vocabularies that do not manage to go beyond themselves in the sense of having a grasp upon a truth, be it representational or ideal. What I believe to be truly strange about this shift, a shift that one might say it is a betrayal of analytical philosophy for a continental philosophy, is the fact that it nevertheless is an analytical critique. To put it differently, Rorty's critique of analytical philosophy and of epistemology comes from the perspective, or I should say the vocabulary of analytical philosophy. To attack the very idea of a theory of knowledge or uh, the notion of truth by affirming that knowledge or reaching truth is not possible is basically an attempt to extinguish fire with fire. To say that nature does not, does not speak for itself, it is us who speak for it in a non-representational or non-ideal way, presupposes an acceptance of precisely one of the very tenets of analytical philosophy. That genuine knowledge is accessible, finally, in a linguistic propositional form, and truth is characteristic of propositional expression. So for Rorty, in his option to escape analytical philosophy and epistemology through hermeneutics is actually an analytically driven, driven decision. For he does not opt for another way of engaging truth, but accepts the failure of uh, what he sees as analytical philosophy as a dead end that finally destroys any possible attempt for an authentic philosoph philosophical endeavor. For Rorty, as Rockmore insists, epistemology is an attempt to close the door for any discussion, whereas hermeneutics is a never ending opening of doors. So to put, it, to put things in perspective, in Rockmore's view, Rorty is an anti-epistemological skeptic that moves towards hermeneutics as a way out of the paradigm of truth. My view is that although this might be the case, Rorty nevertheless remains negatively at the margins of analytical philosophy or the analytical tradition. Next, we will look into Gadamer as an anti-epistemological philosopher that opts for hermeneutics as the only meaningful way into the paradigm of truth. Without going into much detail, when it comes to Gadamer's option with, uh, uh, within our epistemology versus hermeneutics tension, he goes all the way hermeneutical. For Gadamer, uh, there is no place for epistemology, uh, not because of epistemology's failure to truthfully speak of reality, but because of the undetected hermeneutical dimension that is already present there. 
epistemology is insincere, and although it might be success, successful within natural sciences, it has nothing to do with the actual human affairs. Uh, Rock more rightly suggests that the central tenet of Gadamer's plea for hermeneutics is intended to be descriptive, where tradition is always part of our understanding of anything. Tradition is seen there as a prior understanding. In this sense, every authentic engagement with reality is intrinsically connected to its historical situation so that when one tries to understand something, what actually happens or should ideally happen is a fusion of horizons, a meeting between my presuppositional network and the others. When the two coincide, it is a matter of merely understanding one's tradition. There's no interpretation that stands out of one's own tradition. And more technically, there is no interpretation, interpretation that does not operate with um, prior judgments, with prejudgments. In his magnum opus, Truth and Method, he undeniably accepts hermeneutics as most prior and universal, tacitly discrediting epistemology as a naive, groundless speech. F for uh, Gadamer, as we have seen, knowledge is not comprehension of an object, but a meeting between two horizons where a dialogue, or as he says, a new language can happen. And here is where I believe we should stop and address probably the, the most tender issue, one that I have intentionally eluded so far, that if epistemology is concerned with uh, the knowledge of uh, uh, what is real of reality, hermeneutics seems to be as a subset of epistemology concerned with the knowledge of texts. And here is what Rockmore says uh, with great perplexity. And I quote, the consequence for textual interpretation is clear and important, so far so good, but textual interpretation is a mere subset of the wider question of knowledge or epistemology in general. The textual approach is interested, but also intrinsically limited. It is no more plausible to maintain that everything in the world can be reduced to a text than it is to argue that all sciences can be re-expressed within the language of physics. So, so what we have here is a dilemma. Whether or not the conjunction between epistemology and hermeneutics has never actually been uh, has never actually been a, a real conjunction. A, a, what if it's a mere confusion of, of discourses? Uh, Tom Rockmore's conclusion is that finally, epistemology is a form of hermeneutics in the sense that our best chance for truth is by finding a middle way where hermeneutics does not textualize everything and epistemology does not objectify, objectify everything. Hermeneutics does destroy uh, the idea of a groundless epistemology, the one that Rockmore calls the Cartesian dream, uh, making epistemology more grounded in actuality and in tradition in concrete paradigms. And therefore, it's more malleable and open to change and restoration. Although I am profoundly seduced by Tom Rockmore's line of thought, as I announced in the beginning, I cannot fully accept his conclusions. I say so precisely because although the, although such reconciliation is, is satisfying, it does not fully reflect what I actually what actually happens when one looks into the world. It, it still is somewhat normative, corrective, and, and ideal. What concerns me is something more, I should say, grounded in the experiential reality. And let me put it uh, uh, differently. When I know something, I know it to be true, and I know it to be true, but I, I do not do so by tempering to extremes, one of hermeneutical pre-understanding and the other of epistemological method. That would be, I believe, rather uh, dubious and, and un unnatural. My claim is that these two attitudes, uh, as polar opposites, paradoxically contained between experience. M more precisely, they are immediately contained. There's no tempering of extremes, but an agonistic containment. To uh, take up the issue concretely, the epistemological method that I use when, I, when attempting to know something and has the pretense of being objective, 
nevertheless, I take myself as the ground upon which that knowledge of that particular something could ascribe to the possibility of being true. Experientially, there is no method that I ever use, nor is there any time in the process of knowing where I take myself as an epistemic grounding. By no means, it is a, a spontaneous experience. One that, uh, one that is fully mine, and as it is formulated into any type of syntax, it is fully objective. This paradox should not be solved, for it is never experienced as a conflict, as it is a agonistical given. As I said, when formulated, when given syntactic form, it is the very core of expression uh, that I take upon myself to know something to be true by the fact that it is true to me. And nevertheless, it is, as it is formed, as if it can and is true to anyone. This inner and outer struggle is in no sense a middle way, but as I said, agonistic containment. As announced in the beginning of my talk, let us not overcrowd the philosophical discourse with more philosophical discourse, or let us not explain something obsessively within its own terms, but shift our attention for a possible clearer view. Uh, let us look upon the issue of biblical truth, that is the Christian biblical truth, and the fictionalist attitude towards it. But firstly, I would like to briefly engage with what I believe to be the two opposing attitudes towards fiction. And by doing so, I believe we can <clears throat> restate our thesis and, and further explore the issue with biblical fictionalism. Well, the issue of fiction is usually tackled by philosophy from within the paradigm of uh, its reality and subsequently of its truth value. Although it makes a great discussion to talk about fictional objects, fictional entities and possible worlds, I believe we're making a disservice to what fiction really is and more seriously, what imagination actually does. Uh, did anyone seen ever uh, uh, believe that uh, say, uh, Mr. Frodo Baggins from the Shire really existed or exists. Of course, epistemologically, this thought could be transferred into severe issues uh, regarding the world into which such character actually exists. Yet, isn't it a bit naive to mistreat, mistreat uh, uh, Mr. Frodo like so? It, isn't this just another geeky way to butcher a beautiful narrative and turn it into another sinister philosophical debate. I believe that there is a way in which the productive force of, of fiction and the dynamics of imagination could be restored into its more natural place, not by elimination of the epistemological attitude, but by regaining that very agonistic feature that we kept talking about, the hermeneutic epistemological agony. We will do so not by forcefully describing these two separately, but by working through one towards another and see how they both work as an experiential whole. We will work through the epistemological attitude towards fiction into the hermeneutic attitude. Let me start <clears throat> in a not so common fashion and go into Austin's um, how to do things with words. As you probably already know, Austin um, makes a crafty distinction between constitutive utterances and performative uh, utterances. Constitutive utterances are utterances of facts, descriptive, that may be true or false. On the other hand, performative utterances are utterances that have the power to make something happen. For example, when someone tells you to shut up and you somehow do so and shut up. Well, taking on this useful distinction, uh, the literary theorist uh, Lubomir Dotzel jumps straight into the problem of fiction and describes the speech act produced by the narrator and its effectivity. His claim is quite interesting. When, his, when this anonymous voice of the fictional narrator this third person that he calls heterodiegetic, when he speaks, the authentication authority 
is so whole that it does exactly what Austin's performative speech acts do. In other words, this heterodiegetic narrator creates the fictional world by describing it, just as performative statements have the power to make something happen. In this sense, Within fiction, there is a perfect consonance between the narrator's voice and the created world. By being so, something profoundly interesting happens. Because one may say, the uttered fiction is fully knowable. Whereas when it comes to nonfiction, one is more reserved with the regards to the knowability of it. This brings us to the hermetic attitude where the issue of knowing a fiction is shifted into the issue of productive reference. In other words, the hermeneutic attitude when engaging a fiction opens its door into all reality, into nonfiction. This, I know, sounds rather pompous, but let me briefly entangle it by peeking into Paul Ricoeur's essay, The Function of Fiction in Shaping Reality. Uh, the main goal of this work is to release imagination from the confines of epistemology and see its permeation into all experience. More particularly, uh, Ricoeur seeks to rediscover imagination as something productive rather than reproductive. Imagination is not merely a picture, but uh, through fiction, it can augment, it can augment reality. In contrast with epistemology's preoccupation with knowing, hermeneutics, at least in this phase, is more interested in making. This happens through what Ricoeur calls productive reference, where the fictional narrative description escapes the confines of the described fictional world, ultimately producing more truth here in the actual non-fictional reality. But what does this presuppose actually. On the one hand, <clears throat> it means that fiction stands as a possible entrance into real experience as a narrative that gives meaning and wholeness to reality itself. It is a source of meaning here in this reality, precisely because a fiction's meaning is so open and so knowable. Through fiction, one does not only see himself within that um, noble narrative, but also comes back edified, uh, edified about the actual reality. On the other hand, it means that fiction, although it is a product of imagination, calls for imagination, in this case, the imagination of the reader to effectuate the references. This ultimately means that when you enter that fictional world, you are drawn into it. You do not just survey it from an epistemological standpoint, but there is something else, uh, something that breaches yet again the confines of the fictional world. Uh, you as the interpreter use that fiction as a detour for getting to reveal yourself throughout that world. But, but what does this even mean? Uh, it, it means that in the hermeneutical attitude, the concern is not for knowing the world, but knowing yourself. And even though an intended epistemological endeavor, through an intended epistemological endeavor, you still fall into a knowing of oneself rather than that fiction. Yet again, we, we find ourselves ourselves within that very agonistic situation that cannot be solved into a higher situation, but struggles continuously. When entering the issue of fiction, one deals both with a non-existent object or entity or world that can be methodologically uh, analyzed as such and making it almost useful, but still falls into its trap, into its call, losing oneself into that fiction and finding oneself outside of it. Uh, this, uh, again, works with, if I may say so, two truths. The truth that makes fiction a mere pretense that may be useful, and the truth that makes fiction a truthful account of myself. In an actual experience with fiction within 
reading or interpreting a work of fiction, these two truths struggle unresolved, yet still functioning just fine. Now, to cut to the chase, when it comes to the paradigm of biblical fictionalism, one challenges the very reality of the events described within the sacred text, yet it reappropriates it in a new reality uh, or one's own experience. It takes the propositional truth of the Bible as being false, yet it tries to absorb and apply what one believes to be its presuppositional truth. Maybe something in the lines of a hippie ethics of love. Uh, Andrew Eshelman, um, a, a clear proponent of, of uh, biblical fictionalism says, so because of the benefits it brings, one lives as if religion were true. But what does this mean? Well, on the one hand, a, a biblical fictionalism, ex, a fictionalist accepts the epistemological conclusions or unmaskings regarding the non-existence of, let's say, the miracles of Jesus, but, but still recontextualizes those fictional accounts or their supposed presuppositional grounds within one's uh, own reality. This means nothing else that one should take care of the sick today, not by praying for a miracle, but with the same fundamental intent, maybe give money uh, to a Facebook birthday charity. Of course, we might say that this is an applied formula of what we have been talking about since now, that what we have here actually contains the epistemological attitude and the hermeneutical attitude. But it is in no way the case for, as suggested, as a hypothesis in the beginning of my talk, we have inverted the natural way in which one engages with reality. And we did so purposefully. My hypothesis again was that every propositional truth is first and foremost a presuppositional truth. If we make it the other way around, we end up inventing stories. Let's briefly take a different route. In our very domain of biblical fictionalism, one's presupposition is that the Bible is a fiction. Maybe not an intended fiction, but nevertheless a fiction. Why is it that this is a presupposition and not, not let's say, a, a deduction? Without going into uh, much detail, it is so because when one says that the, bi the biblical text is fictional, it refers to it as a as false in regards to one's experience or access to experience, ultimately meaning that it is a presupposition that is a part of one, what one might call a radically scientific worldview. It, it practically takes for granted the, the, the primacy of what, for example, Kant might call mathematics, physics, uh, and synthetic a priori judgments as a Definite, definitive constraint for what can be known to be real. In, in this very fashion does Kant treat the problem of theology. Here, here's what Kant says in, in, in uh, his uh, peculiar text, the philosophy faculty versus the theology faculty. He says, for if, if God should really speak to man, man could never know that it is God speaking. It is quite impossible for man to apprehend the infinite in his senses, distinguish it from sensible beings and recognize it as such. But in the same, but in some cases, man can be sure that the voice he hears is not from God's. For if the voice commands him to do something contrary to the moral law, then no matter how majestic the apparition may be, <clears throat> and no matter how it may seem to surpass the whole nature, he must consider it an illusion. Well, well of course, here Kant speaks of Abraham and, and the command that God gave him to sacrifice uh, his son Isaac, his only son. But it is it clear, as it is clear here, Kant assumes that the very idea 
that God might communicate such a thing to a human being is fundamentally illusory precisely because it goes against the very moral law that God has placed within the human being in the first place. Again, what is the presupposition here? That all that we can know is ultimately apprehended as a phenomena, as phenomena within, within one's sensible experience and, and internal moral law. Of course, for Kant, this does not come as a presupposition, but as a necessary metaphysical axiom. For him, the Bible should be understood as if it is a divine revelation, not because of its historical and dogmatic accuracy, but because of its moral universality. To put it even more drastically, Kant's presupposition is that the biblical text is a fiction because it speaks of things that are either illusory or blatantly wrong for one's structure of reason. In this sense, we come back to that very issue that was explored by Tom Rockmore's in, in his analysis of Rorty and Gunnaman, that of epistemology with, which bears the scientific method is for one a failed vocabulary and for the other an unfertile and artificial prejudgment. In, in some sense, Kant's fictionalism or uh, let's say Hume's critique of miracles all follow the same minimal presupposition that all that can be known can already be known. In other words, there's nothing else that can be known that does not have a correspondent or a faculty of principles within reason. With this presupposition, one will almost immediately regard biblical texts as being fictional or the least <clears throat> historically based fictions for there is no reasonable way through which such histories, prophecies, heavens and hells, exhortations, or divine persons might exist. But this is where it all gets a little bit more tricky. The Bible has its very own presuppositions too. The, the central figure of the Bible has some presuppositions and they all seem to go against what we earlier identified as being the minimal presupposition of a biblical fictionalist. One, one of the most radical uh, presuppositions uh, um, that we can find all the way through the biblical text uh, and is at the very core of the gospel and the, the news of Christianity <clears throat> is that the human being is corrupt, sinful, and severely incapacitated. His reason quite directly included. It might be so, and this is something uh, for another talk, that the very origins of the scientific method and the Baconian practical experiential turn in his philosophy of nature to have its source in this exact presupposition that human reason is corrupted by sin, by the idols of the mind, <clears throat> and has to be restored in the light of uh, the book of God. Well, within this presuppositional clash, the whole issue is being disputed. It is in no way a problem of arguments or reasoning, but the presupposition that stand behind all beliefs. A biblical uh, fictionalist is working through the Bible with a presupposition that goes precisely against the biblical claims. And one of the most uh, superb way in which the, the Christian message managed to permeate for so long all our culture is <clears throat> because of its strange call for radical faith. For if our reason is corrupt by sin and through reason we fail to understand the message, it is only through divine intervention that one might be able to manage his way through the message itself. Technically, this means that not only that there is no presuppositionless way to get into the Bible, but our natural presupposition, presuppositions will always be an error. The call is for a new reason, a new mind, metanoia. In this sense, even if for our natural immediate reason, the message of the Bible strikes as fiction, by gaining through faith this new reason, it all becomes meaningful, it becomes truthful. It is 
accurate, even historically, dogmatically, and so on. Now, without getting too the theological, we can see something even more strange and nonetheless captivating in this. Uh, the Bible has numerous claims that make its message universal and objective. It ultimately is a call for all, not just for the ones that happen to be changed, converted, the ones that share through faith its presuppositions, but also for the, I may, I may say, the, the non-elect. This means that the Bible's claim is that it is true not only for the ones that have been saved, but also for the ones that see it as a fiction. This immense violence is, is the main purpose for bringing about the, the discussion about biblical fictionalism, for it is the most radical embodiment of what we have constantly repeated throughout this talk, the epistemological and the hermeneutical attitude, the presuppositional truth and the presuppositional truth, uh, the propositional truth and the presuppositional truth, sorry, the naked truth and, and the truth that is true to me. Uh, let's finally <clears throat> look briefly at an example in Jean Calvin uh, and his cunning way of illuminating the paradoxical nature of biblical truth. For him, there are three legal engagements with the biblical truth. The first form is the accusatory function in which the righteousness of God is revealed for the one getting in touch with this truth and to be warned, informed, and fully condemned by his own unrighteousness. The, the second form is the compelling function through which one is threatened and is in a fear of punishment. And the, the third and the principal use of the law, the totalex, the whole law, is the urging function. And it, it, it imposes the believers to, into good works. Why did I went into this Calvinistic legal sphere of the biblical truth? On the one hand, what we see here is that there are three functions of God's law revealed in scripture. These three functions have two possible recipients, as we've seen, the non-elect and the elect, the non-believer and the believer. The first two functions of the law, the accusatory and the compelling, are functioning for non-believers. And the third urging function is adhering only to, to the believer. But with all this in mind, there's something strange that Calvin also insists upon and, and should be taking into consideration with great care, that within the third function of the law, the other two are not abolished, but contained and probably situated into a narrative of salvation within which Christ uh, has taken upon himself both the accusation and the punishment for one's sins. Let me take a, a final step and once again reassemble what I have been repeating throughout this talk. What we have here are, at first glance, two incompatible attitudes towards truth, an epistemological attitude that finds the accusatory shortcomings of knowledge, or at best is compelled to act as if there's something viable or practical about it. And there's a hermeneutical attitude that seems to be utterly unconcerned with the scandalous particularities by being preoccupied with the grand scheme, a comprehensive narrative, or the tradition that somehow gives meaning to all. It is precisely here in, in the issue with this incompatibility towards the biblical truth that we can have a glimpse of what I mean by an agonistic containment of these two polar opposites. That just as Calvin's third function of the law, the biblical tr truth is first and foremost presuppositional, Christologically narrative. And after that, it is also with the same weight propositional. In other words, only through the new mind, the new radical Christian worldview, will one be able to see that, to take Kant's example uh, yet again, when, when Abraham was asked to sacrifice his son Isaac, he did so precisely because his faith enabled him to fully understand that just as God gave him a living son from his barren wife, 
uh, he could just as well bring him back from the dead. Ultimately, he believed in God's propositional promise that he will have a son only through his faith in, gra in, in, in God's grand scheme that promised that through his seed, he will bring salvation into the world. He, he will bring Jesus. So the propositional truth of the Bible affirming Abraham's faith and his encounter with God is always to be grounded in the presuppositional truth that there is a grand narrative that permeates the Bible, a narrative that is ultimately expressed within the historical person of Jesus Christ. Now, coming back from our biblical trials, what can this mean for us? Uh, how could this be something relevant? Uh, well, just as for a Christian, uh, Abraham's sacrifice of Isaac does not mean anything without God's final sacrifice of Jesus, any particular propositional truth would benefit from its presuppositional drive, the voice through which one actually formulated that proposition about reality, be it, say, scientific voice, a narrative voice, a popular communal voice, or as it is in the case of Christians, the voice of God. Thank you for listening. I'm going to stop the recording now.